Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi. I'm here with Captain David Brooks at the Wilbur Rounding Franks Building at 17 Wing in Winnipeg, and we're looking at an altitude chamber. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your job here and what these chambers are used for? Okay, so my job here is I'm the Aeromedical Flight Commander at, mm -hmm. uh, here at the School for Survival and Aeromedical Training. And uh, what we do with, these, uh, with the hyperbaric chamber behind us here is we uh, take air crew, so anybody who's a pilot, uh, a navigator, or anybody who's going to be working in the back of the aircraft as their job, and we need to train them about the uh, hazards of flight. One of those hazards is to be able to recognize and respond to hypoxia or a lack mm. of oxygen due to uh, oxygen equipment failure or anything like that. And obviously it's not safe to do that in an aircraft. <laughs> yeah. So what we do here is we use this chamber here to actually simulate the same amount of altitude that they would be cruising at when they might have a mask seal, seal failure in their mask or anything mm. like that. Uh, we use a smaller chamber here that you're going to see a little later on the video mm -hmm. uh, that to take that up to 60,000 feet. And then we will equalize the pressure between the two chambers to, ex to simulate a uh, explosive decompression, mm -hmm. which would be the same thing as uh, say you lose a, uh, you lose a uh, window or a door seal mm -hmm. uh, at altitude. You know, when you get the whole, put your mask on before, uh, before yeah, you get exactly, out of the mask yeah. on. So that's what we're kind of doing here. We're actually training them the why that happens and mm -hmm how to respond to those things. So we'll do the explosive decompression there, then another day we will go and we will take them up to a simulated, that takes them up to a simulated altitude of 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, will, the next day we'll take them up to a simulated altitude of 16,000 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we put them in the dark and get them breathe ambient air and they'll see differences in how their eyes adapt to the dark. And, okay. uh, so when they go on oxygen about 30 minutes later, mm -hmm. they'll actually see the, uh, the chamber brighten up and everything else. Uh, and it tells them how insidious uh, mm -hmm. hypoxia can be. So what the hazard is if they don't recognize it. So the first thing to go is probably is your vision. Absolutely, because yeah. the, the eyes are very oxygen hungry. Yes. So <clears throat> then and we'll go the, back. And I would assume the occipital lobe as well. Like oh, that absolutely. part of your brain is, yeah, right. assuming so that. What's, okay. what's gonna happen then is we'll, we'll turn the lights back on They'll get uh, on oxygen. Mm -hmm. We take them back to 10,000 feet, and then we combine a gas, which we call combined altitude and depleted oxygen. Okay. So it's about 5% oxygen, mm -hmm. and the rest of it nitrogen. And uh, it simulates an altitude of 25,000 feet with them still being at only 10,000 feet. So there's no risk of decompression illness. Oh, okay. Interesting. And what that'll do is when they're on the mass, <clears throat> that will get them hypoxic quick, mm -hmm. to the point where they will try, they'll identify that, oh, if I'm feeling like this in the aircraft, mm -hmm. I'm going to be, I'm going to know to be able to go on oxygen. So I'm going to be able to warn my, my crew members. I'm going to be able to uh, warn maybe the pilots up in the air if I'm in the back that there's a problem and we all go on oxygen. And depending on the situation, they can go down to a area where they can breathe normal air or they stay on the oxygen system in the aircraft if, uh, if, the, if the tactical situation is that way. Okay, so in the mixture, so it's uh, just an enriched nitrogen mixture? Yeah. So just cut with nitrogen, but without lowering the pressure? Yeah, exactly. So okay. we do lower the pressure to, uh, to 10,000 feet. Yeah, but then you can't <clears throat> go beyond that without inducing you know, the risk of right. so, decompression sickness. Yeah. So we still take them to 16,000 feet before that, yeah. um, <clears throat> because there's a very low risk of uh, decompression mm -hmm. Uh, the risk of decompression illness doesn't increase until after you go to 18,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So obviously we, we used to have a dive chamber. We used to mm -hmm. take people to 25,000 feet back about 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was going on is we were getting too many uh, cases of DCI distant training. Mm -hmm. So by doing this method, we were able to reduce that risk to zero. Oh, okay. So it's a very, it's, it's still a high risk training because again, we're basically uh, taking away people's breathing oxygen. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a lot safer than the way we were doing it. Okay, interesting. So uh, theoretically, like, to what, uh, like, how many millimeters of mercury could you get in these chambers? Like, how low can they go? Ah, uh, so this chamber is actually rated to go to 10, sorry, 100,000 feet. Uh, oh, wow. Above, uh, like, so ambient atmosphere. There is two vacuum pumps here that will actually do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you're going to show them there, but they're mm -hmm. back there. It's very loud and noisy, but that's exactly what it does. So we have enough that we can take the uh, air out of the chamber to go to about 100,000 feet if that was necessary. Yeah, I don't see any pressure suits around here, so no, <laughs> no, probably no. wouldn't be doing no, that's, that. Uh, uh, however, there's another chamber exactly like this in Toronto mm -hmm. at what used to be DCIM, 
or the Directorate of Civil uh, uh, Institute of Medicine, mm -hmm. which is now known as the direct, uh, BRDC, which is uh, Defense Research and Development Canada. Mm -hmm. And they actually uh, will go up to that high to test things out uh, theoretically. So, uh, or for different uh, protective, uh, 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 different protective clothing, or different regulators, or different things like that. They're going to do that. They also go up and they might test things like mountain ops. So they might, okay, they yeah. might keep people there at about ten to fifteen thousand feet. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's definitely a use of it. Again. This smaller chamber does have to go to 60,000 feet mm -hmm. on the regular to do that decompression. Yeah, just so it just serves as a, a vacuum tank. Absolutely. To further blow down. Okay, interesting. You're right. So like the, the smaller the smaller chamber here is literally just uh, there as a, uh, a, a, thing to, a chamber to equalize between the two. Yep. There used to be, back in the day, uh, this uh, and in Toronto, there are medical treatments that, uh, that have been done for different people at smaller groups at, that might need hyperbaric yeah. uh, oxygen uh, to see if they've got problems with flying on civil aviation. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been done in the past, but we haven't done that in the, as long as I've been here anyway. Okay. Uh, so I see there's, you know, for example, color blindness tests and things mm -hmm. like that. So what other tests do you do in terms of like recognizing symptoms? Okay, so we actually have them go through a chart. Uh, you'll see that in there. Uh, or we have an iPad uh, that can, can go and they can play games and what they're trying to do there to simulate a task where mm -hmm. they're using their cognition. So they want to see uh, how well they're doing that. Uh, we also want to distract them a little, distract them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But so they're not hyper focused on exactly, the symptoms. You're not, you're not going to just be focusing on your body in the aircraft. Yeah, exactly. So you, we have them do that, and uh, a lot of them they find that they'll get to a point and they'll, they're very simple puzzles. Like we have one where it's literally connect the dots mm -hmm. uh, or we have something where they're literally counting cards or if you're a five-year-old putting shapes into a bucket <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, they realize I'm confused at doing this. Yeah. So uh, it's also to show them that the reaction time might slow or that they might have some mental confusion. Mm -hmm. Which is not a safe thing. <laughs> no, you don't want to be flying an airplane with mental confusion. No. Uh, so the chamber itself, uh, I think on the nameplate, it says installed 1954? Yes, it was, uh, it, it was actually built in uh, September 1954 mm -hmm. and delivered to uh, what used to be the, uh, just a school of aeromedical uh, training, which was in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Okay. Uh, it was brought here in 1996 mm -hmm. uh, when the schools of aeromedical training and uh, survival both combined into this bu the current building here in, tr in uh, uh, 17 Wing here in Winnipeg. Okay, and I see a lot of the equipment is oh, looks original, especially this chart <laughs> yes, recorder uh, here. Yes, this, this is the Taylor recorder. This actually will you can see right here, and you'll probably get another thing. Yeah. This is actually a run we did today, where it'll actually record the time and how long we were at altitude. Okay. And yes, this is original. This is actually a. It, they now come in digital, mm -hmm. but uh, this is still working, so there's no reason to replace it. If it, it. ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So all it is is really a, a pen nib. Yeah and an altimeter that'll actually uh, record exactly what's going mm -hmm. on, and this just spins. And yeah, this is original to the, uh, to the chamber, and it still works quite yeah. well. So uh, how much other original equipment other than the chambers themselves? I'm guessing not a lot would have had to have been changed. Oh, no, uh, the only thing that we've really changed in the uh, time that this has been around has been we changed out the windows every 10 years. Oh, okay, because I guess they get micro cracks exactly. and things like we, that. We want to yeah. make sure that the chamber's still, uh, still solid and it's still uh, not going to leak air in. Um, but yeah, everything else is, is uh, fairly original. The altimeters here and some of the instruments, they're obviously been uh, changed out mm -hmm. as time needs because again, yep. the instruments are time, yep. time sensitive. But uh, these are about, right now, these are about 25 years old. Okay. But again, they're being replaced uh, short, they're being replaced um, just because new ones are coming in the system and, we can't, and they can't support calibrating these anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, we, those are going to have to be replaced. A new thing that we do have is we do have a, we have added um, a video uh, feed and you, with camera high definition cameras in there so that we can actually film the students and that it, so if somebody does forget what their signs were mm -hmm. or we have somebody that ha is a different uh, an abnormal reactor mm -hmm. right uh, we can show a video of to them of uh, their uh, their symptoms out, outside so not what they were feeling but their what they would have been yeah, displaying what they are presenting exactly. yeah okay so part of the training is also to get the crew members to be able to identify hypoxia in other crew members okay well thank you so much for your time and showing this to us um, 
Uh, I'm Jean Merci from Our Own Devices. Uh, tune in next time for another fascinating object. You know, not all of them as large as this one are going to actually fit inside a cabinet of curiosities. But anyway, thank you for watching. Have a great day.